on the News Channel 5 Network. This is Morning Line with Nick Barris. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us on Morning Line. Nick Barris here with you on a Wednesday, and I invite you to join in the conversation this morning. We are going to be joined in a moment by a guest live via Skype, and we're going to talk about the coronavirus. Uh, what else is there to talk about, though? I, I grant you, it'd be nice to have a nice reprieve from it once in a while, but uh, it still is the topic of conversation as long as there are new developments. And what we want to do today is give you a chance at home to ask an expert. Some of the the questions you may have with regard to the virus, COVID-19, how it works, and more specifically, what I'm going to want to ask is what we have learned now that we've had a chance to observe this for a period of time. And keep in mind, it's new. That's one of the reasons we're having such a problem dealing with it. This is something completely new. And so everything, every day that passes, I think we can learn more about the way it behaves and I think better the way to defeat it. So that's kind of the focus this morning. The 737-7587 number's up on the screen. If you want to join in the conversation, hop in and you'll have a chance to join us now uh, with Dr. James Hildbreth. Good morning to you, doctor. Nice to have you with us. Good morning. I'm really happy to be here. Of course, Thank President, you. President and CEO of Meharry Medical College has been involved in uh, many of the uh, news conferences here in Metro with the mayor and uh, an infectious disease expert. And sir, thank you again for joining us. And you know, I'd like to get a start with you um, to get your take on the significance of the CDC order and beyond with regard to recommending people wear masks. Now you and I are sitting alone right now, we're not wearing masks, but I mean, do you yourself now, will you wear a mask out in public and, and where exactly is the real benefit to the person wearing the mask if indeed there is? I think it's a, it's a necessary step at this stage in the pandemic. And masks serve two purposes really. They can block the virus from being transmitted from an infected person to an uninfected person, but they can also help protect the uninfected person from getting the virus. So if everyone wears a mask when they're out, it will decrease the likelihood of transmission very significantly. And at this stage, we need to do all that we can do to slow the virus down. So that's not a substitute for staying at home. People still need to do that and keep the social distancing but if you have to go out at this stage, it really is a great idea to have a face covering on. Just go ahead and wear it. And I, I'm just curious, and that makes perfect sense. And I, I totally agree with that. I especially understand the idea if someone is sick to have that and that keeps it, you from spreading it. Now, I'm, I'm just curious, the virus itself though, I mean, as small as it is, I mean, Someone <laughs> described it as being, you know, small enough to make its way through a lot of these handmade, homemade masks. I mean, can the masks really sure. stop the virus from getting through? The, the, the honest truth is we don't quite know the size of the droplets that this virus is in. It's very unlikely that the virus itself as a single particle is being projected or exhaled. It's probably part of a droplet of, you know, a a droplet of water and air so small that we can't see it. And it is true that the N95 mask, for example, can block things down to the micron and even lower than that, smaller than that. But if you make a face covering and it has multiple layers, you get a seeding effect that can effectively block smaller things. So the truth is we don't quite know yet the nature of what's being transmitted from one person to the other. It may not be a free virus particle. The particle might be part of a droplet. But the point is that whether it's a virus itself or a droplet, if you wear a face covering that has multiple layers, you can still limit the ability of the virus to be transmitted. So the face coverings are really important. All right. And we need to reserve the professional PPE for the professionals because they're on the front lines every day and they need to take first priority for having those things. Okay, point taken. I think I hope everyone observes that. Um, let me ask you this. Uh, one thing that I've seen with some concern is that the, the nature of this virus, when it attacks someone, you get sick. And there have been cases where some people have shown some improvement to the point maybe where they were discharged from the hospital and then all of a sudden 
it strikes back at you, okay? And and it comes back with yes. a rage just what, what what are we learning about that? Is this because of something that just changes in the individual, but you think they're doing better and some people do continue to get better and recover and others they go home feeling better and then that night boom it comes back with a fury. So the evidence speaks to the fact that this is probably the immune system uh, doing what it does, but doing it excessively. So the immune system consists of organs, cells, and small molecules. These small molecules are called cytokines, and their role is to recruit other cells and release other chemicals that would fight the virus. But if the immune response is over exuberant, it ends up damaging our own tissues in addition to killing the virus. And ordinarily, there's an orchestrated release of these chemicals by the cells. But in what's called a cytokine storm, the release is uncontrolled. And maybe as many as a dozen of these cytokines are released, as opposed to a handful that should be there. So it appears that it's the immune system working over time in what's called a cytokine storm that's causing these rebounds. And again, it's, it's, the virus is still there, but the immune system is so overly active is causing damage to the body in addition to trying to eliminate the virus. And is that something then that is just case by case? Some individuals, I've heard some people say, you know, when you get this, you just don't know. It's almost like Russian roulette. Yes, well, uh, the immune systems and how it functions varies from person to person. So sometimes this is totally unexpected. And as you say, a person could look like they're recovering or recovered but then the immune system comes with this second wave, the cytokine storm happens, and it's really the immune system that's causing that crash, not the virus. And because there's genetic differences in how our immune system is put together and what the proteins and molecules are, that's why we just don't know who's gonna get this and who is not. But there are a lot of scientists in the country who are researching this, trying to find the most effective ways to treat it. So one idea is to dampen down the immune response but you don't necessarily want to do that because the immune response is what's controlling the virus. Mm -hmm. So if you dampen the immune system too much, you might in fact give the virus free reign in the body. So there needs to be a balance between keeping the immune system tuned as it needs to be, but also getting rid of the virus. And that, there's a lot of research now happening in that respect. With regard to the various treatments that have been discussed, I forget the exact name, but the drug that we think treats malaria that some think, and uh, it seems almost like we get mixed signals sometimes from the president saying, well, this seems like something we need to move forward with, and then the head of the CDC saying, look, there's no proven facts on this. I get a lot of Facebook messages with people tell you, talking about, hey, well, maybe I should take this, and I've also heard if I take this, it'll help. What do we know about anything out there right now that's potentially working for, and we have proof of it, besides anecdotal evidence. Right. Well, the evidence for hydrochloroquine and chloroquine, they're not very compelling. And in fact, in a, a small study I'm aware of from China, they used hydrochloroquine and chloroquine and plus another uh, HIV drug, I think it was. And the evidence was very inconclusive. In fact, in some of the individuals, it might have caused them to get a little bit worse. Uh, what we need to do is to do a clinical trial where we have controls, placebo, large numbers of individuals so that the data can be convincing one way or the other. And we just don't have that for these drugs. Um, one thing that I'm excited about is, you know, the laboratories have been using supercomputers to identify drug candidates. And what that means is that these supercomputers can recreate viral proteins in cyberspace. They can do the same thing for the existing drugs and determine if any of them latch on to each other. The way that drugs work usually for viruses, they attach themselves to one of the critical proteins and block function, and that disallows the virus to replicate. So what they're doing with the supercomputers is creating virtual replicas of viruses and virus proteins and virtual replicas of the drugs, asking which of these might bind to the virus or virus proteins and inhibit it. And we have, I think it's up to 69 candidates that have been identified. And these drugs are now being tested in laboratories against the virus. And one of the encouraging things about this is that these are existing drugs, some of them, that have already been FDA approved. And they would be repurposed to fight the virus. And so that's very exciting. Uh, so people need to know that there is an intense effort 
at multiple levels to find a drug, but that's one that I'm, I'm particularly excited about. And that's interesting. That's to kind of, I guess, fight it, but in terms of cures. Is it not true, doctor, that the, uh, the coronavirus, okay, I mean, that is an umbrella term. COVID-19 is this one, but I mean, isn't the common cold a coronavirus and the greatest minds in medical science, people are like, well, can't we come up with a cure? We never have cured the common cold, okay? It, the coronavirus, there is no <laughs> cure for that. You treat the symptoms. That's is true. that ultimately what it comes down to in this case? There's not going to be a cure for a that's virus. Exactly. Well, I mean, that's true. And ultimately, the real answer is the vaccine. But as you point out, there are now seven members to what's called the human coronavirus family. And four of those viruses have been circulating in humans for a long time. And as you say, maybe as many as a third or a, a half of all the common colds that we experience are caused by one of these other four coronaviruses. There's four viruses that cause the common cold. Then there was the SARS virus, the MERS virus, and now the, the COVID-19 virus. So there's seven viruses in the human coronavirus family and this raises another point that we need to study which is those other four viruses are seasonal which means that year after year they come back and for that reason there's a, a bit of herd immunity to them in other words our bodies have gotten to know them and make responses to them so people can respond and fight them off uh, if the coronavirus that we're dealing with now becomes seasonal that makes the vaccine even more imperative and thankfully the vaccine efforts are underway and there are at least two candidates that are in trials right now as we speak so i think that's why developing a vaccine is so very important given the likelihood and we don't know how likely it is but it's possible that this might become a seasonal challenge for us gotcha sir stay right where you are we have to take a quick break we'll be back with another segment with you if that's all right and we'll be joined by some phone thank callers you. as well with questions just hang tight and thank you again for joining us this morning dr james hildreth is with us from over at meharry we'll be back with more with him right after this